and honored. I am humbled and honored at the opportunity to, to help. I ask myself, what could I possibly have to contribute from far off Canada? Um, what could I have to offer when I have never been in a war or even close to one? I have never personally experienced the trauma of my world falling apart around me. I have asked myself that question. And when I think of it that way, I, I certainly don't feel qualified to speak. Nevertheless, I desperately want to be of help. And from 50 years of dealing with distressed children and adults, including survivors of the Holocaust, I, I believe what I have learned about stress, about surviving stress, about how to prevent stress from turning into long-lasting trauma can, uh, can be of help to you. Uh, at least I hope I can. When times are dire, when chaos reigns, when anguish is all around us, we need to retreat to the basics as how to help. And I, I believe the teacher plays a pivotal role in, in all of this. The answers, however, mustn't be too complicated. We've got enough on our minds. And I hope I can make it uh, uh, for you today that will be easy to visualize, easy to hold on to, uh, especially at a time when it feels you may not be able to think straight. Uh, what I hope uh, for you uh, is, is to, to, to do for you is to provide some guidance and how to provide what you could say trauma-informed care uh, within the school as a teacher. Uh, and I'll share my screen now and go to my first slide. So I've, I've entitled it Helping Students in Trouble, or rather Helping Students in Troubled Times, rather. And it, it really is the application of, uh, of trauma-informed care, which has, has been a recent science. Uh, what I'm uh, looking to basically share with you is when we look at this through the lens of relationship, emotion, and development, what is it do we see? But first, I would like to share with you very briefly what happens to our children uh, as well as to us when we're distressed, but we're thinking of our students now. Um, this knowledge isn't actually necessary to help, fortunately, but it, it can certainly help um, us when we can at least make sense of what we see in our students. Uh, know when they're suffering from trauma, know when they're in trouble. It also points to a way through, and that's one of the main reasons why I want to share it with you, because it points to a way through. Nothing is worse than not being able to make sense of ourselves or our students. And it, it, uh, it can feel as if there's something wrong with us or something wrong with them. It's hard enough when, when everything seems somewhat surreal. And so what I want to share with you again, as I said, first of all, what happens to us when we are distressed? What actually takes place? Now, the first part of this is knowing that what, what uh, is it that is, is distressing for us? Now, was it, is it, uh, what is it actually? And when we put all the pieces together, uh, what comes very, very clear is that we as humans are creatures of togetherness. We get attached. We get attached to people. We get attached to a country. We get attached to our land, our culture. We get attached. We get attached. And, and it turns out that when we're attached, it increases our, our chances of survival. That's at least how our brain is organized, is that survival lies in the context of togetherness. So the most important thing we could say uh, is that we are creatures of togetherness first and foremost. And if we're creatures of togetherness, first and foremost, if, you know, when the bombs drop, a, 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 a student asks, a child asks, not where is safety, but where's mom, where's dad, where's, 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 where's grandma, where's, where's grandma? That, that is the first, the first question that comes is one of connection. Uh, and 
and we'll put ourselves in harm's way because of our attachments. In, in fact, to, pro, pro, to protect the land, the culture we're attached to, we'll put ourselves in harm's way to protect our loved ones. We'll put ourselves in harm's way. So again, attachments are, are, are everything. We are creatures of togetherness. Given that that is how we are programmed, then separation is our greatest threat. So that is at the very core of stress. It's, it's when we face separation from who we're attached to and what we're attached to. Now, it turns out that our emotions, uh, to you know, for a long time, we've not been able to understand why do we have as humans these emotions? And we thought they were you know, basically a, a, a nuisance variable that you could be too emotional and so on. And it turns out that the emotions have purpose. They're there in our brain. They have work to do. In fact, they're the, the workhorses and they're to fix the problems of separation. So when we're facing separation, these emotions are evoked, powerful emotions. These three, we could call the primal separation emotions. There's alarm, of course, you could feel this alarm. Oh my goodness, you just, the alarm is palpable. It doesn't feel safe. And it's meant to move us to caution, to avoid uh, disruption to, to connection. Uh, so there's incredible wisdom in this. It's meant, if possible, to reduce the separation we're facing. There's frustration, of course. Frustration is the experience of something not working. And when things don't work, it occurs to us there's a problem to solve. And when there's a problem to solve, then we try to figure out what do we change? Can we change the circumstances, the situation, us, uh, change others? What do we change? And so at, at a time like this, we're very alarmed. We're very frustrated. Uh, our students are very alarmed, are very frustrated. And there's a third emotion. We don't have a good name for this, uh, but it is when, when we face separation, it triggers intense pursuit uh, to follow, to, to seek, uh, to close the gap, uh, to make sure that no separation occurs. And this is done, all of these things are done both physically, they're done psychologically, all kinds of aspects of, of, of these. And, and again, there's wisdom in this because it's meant to close the gap. It's meant to reduce the separation it's, its face. In the pursuit, there's clutching and clinging. There's doing everything possible to get back to loved ones, even though it may put us into harm's way. In alarm, there's nightmares. There's alarming images, elevated startle response. We can't focus or concentrate on anything. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there's all alarm and frustration. It's just like, Oh my goodness, it's just like life is one unending problem to try to solve. Now, our, our limbic system, our emotional brain can only handle so much. And so when the intensity gets greater for a young child who doesn't have much of a, of a prefrontal cortex, which is the mixing bowl of the brain, these emotions start to cycle. And so you're full of frustration, one point, full of rage, full of attack, and then you're full of alarm, uh, at another point, and then full of pursuit at another point, and 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 these emotions don't mix. What they're supposed to do is 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 if if they're at a lesser level, uh, they mix. And if we've got, uh, if we can feel them, we have the possibility of having a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, when things are intense, it is not a time that uh, that we have mixed feelings. In fact, it's not a time that we're actually feeling this. We feel the results of it. But when students are, are being threatened, when we're being threatened, when students are, it, there is a second part to this. We're full of emotion. Yes, we're full of the emotion of alarm, frustration, and pursuit. We're full of that. But we don't actually feel it. In fact, we don't actually feel anything, even the least bit vulnerable. Uh, what is this about? Well, there's another part to the stress response. And you'll be experiencing this tremendously now. Your students will be experiencing this and so on. There's more emotion, all right. But when we are facing separation, 
what the brain does is it inhibits our ability to feel our emotions. And we have to split these, these two things apart. Like you have to think, well, I can be hungry, but do I feel my hunger? In times of crisis, you don't necessarily feel your hunger. You don't feel your tiredness. As you don't even, sometimes it's even hard to feel your bladder pressure. You don't know if you have to go to the bathroom or not. The feelings are inhibited. Uh, we kind of numb out. Why? Why do we numb out? Well, we numb out to preserve the ability to function in stressful circumstances. Again, there's wisdom in this. There's wisdom in this. But we're meant to, to, to numb out so that we can do our job, our task, save our loved ones, rescue, uh, do what we need to do. Uh, in this case, sometimes even just go to school to teach and the students. And so it, it's, when, it, when it gets serious, it can feel surreal. You, you can't even feel yourself is that there is this sense of feeling. Now, what's supposed to happen? Now, first of all, get the paradox. We've got more emotion. We're more alarmed. We're more frustrated. We're more trying to close the gap, uh, separation, trigger, pursuit, but we're feeling less. Now, all that is meant to be part of uh, homeostasis, emotional homeostasis, uh, in this case, the sine wave, which it represents emotional equilibrium. There is supposed to be, ideally, in culture, in our day, an end of the day. And in our end of the day is a time when our feelings come back. And so whatever feelings have been, uh, have, have been pushed away for us to function, are supposed to be able to come back later on when we're safe, uh, when, when, we, when we're not facing separation. Now, this is ideally how it should happen. This even happens to me when I speak. I am naturally very shy, and I noticed that when I had to speak, sometimes for whole days at a time, I wouldn't feel anything. If people ask me, how are you doing? I wouldn't know if I was tired. I wouldn't know if I was sick or had aches and pains or if I was hungry. But when I got back uh, or I could call home and I heard my wife's voice, all my feelings came tumbling back. All of those felt, first of all, I thought there was something wrong with me. Then I realized, no, 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 this is the way it's supposed to work. This is the way it's always supposed to work. And I was very, very fortunate to have an end of the day, or you could say an end of the week, maybe. After that, things get a little bit stuck. And that is the problem. That is the problem. We, the separation that's being faced is not ending. It's kind of like the perfect storm. There's wisdom in how it should work. We should be able to have safety. This is the resilience response when our feelings bounce back. And it's supposed to be provided to us. We, the, the, the whole idea of the inhibition of feelings is only meant to, to give us some, uh, uh, you know, for a situation, to give us you know, all the energy in, in our, our, our brain and our body is, is, is devoted to do the work. And, but then we need feelings to function. We need feelings to grow up. We need feelings to heal. We need feelings to relate. We need feelings to, it has to do with being fully human and humane. We need our feelings and our feelings come back and they need safety. And so the two places where, where our sanctuary for feelings and this I'm going to come back to because this is everything. This is everything. Is that the sanctuary to feel safe, whether we are safe or not, is to be in the context of relationship. So it's the, the togetherness that feels safe, not the skies, not to the physical environment. It's to, the togetherness that we feel safe. We see, feel safe. A child will feel safe in the company of those that they're attached to, whether they have uh, should feel safe or not, they do. It's a natural sanctuary in the other place that you have a sense of safety is in emotional playgrounds. 
net and I'll expand that a little bit in true play here it's not necessarily screen play it's it's where the emotions can play and that is a place of activated rest now it's incredibly important that the brain gets some rest that there is the end of the day in some way that there is the end of this because the brain starts in getting stuck and not functioning all that well and that is the problem with trauma the problem is is when things get stuck when the response gets struck stuck this is how it should be but when that part is missing and that is the danger now when it is missing and the feelings don't return pretty soon you get kind of used to them you don't even really know that there's something first of all when they go missing you feel kind of numb and then after you kind of like being kind of numb because you know it it it, it doesn't hurt so much there's not so much suffering in in it and so that but there is this elevated instincts and emotion one feels agitated one feels as if one you know highly highly moved and not sure what to do but uh, the when when these get stuck when it's missing and we don't even know what's missing that's a problem here unless you would know this you don't even know what it is that miss that's missing it's when it becomes stuck that it turns into trauma for the individual and so it, then we 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 have then it has its effect within us and that takes a toll it takes a toll in all kinds of ways and these are the adults the victims of the holocaust the survivors of the holocaust i mean and their children and other individuals refugees that i would work with in which the this stress response was stuck and it's what i want to share with you today because it's amazing how much stress that children can actually take and if we do certain things it won't get stuck and even if it is stuck how much we can reverse it and when it comes to a time like this the the prior our priorities as a teacher have to shift a little bit is because you know what we're all about is is taking part in raising children yes uh, but uh, now now their emotional health their ability to function investing in their future adulthood becomes more important than anything else and so when feelings fail to bounce back uh, over too much time, an acute stress response turns into trauma. This is where it happens. And then this, this, uh, the key here is, and this is the part that's important, regardless of what the problem is, what the behavior you see, what is common to all of this, whether it is post-traumatic stress disorder, whether it is aggression, whether it is all kinds of things, uh, obsessive compulsive behavior, whatever it is, the key to all of that. And, the, and, and what lets you know what happened is more emotion, but less feeling. There is more emotion, but less, less feeling. Now, in the short term, if the trauma as it is, that is being experienced now uh, for many with separation from their loved ones and and uh, and the threat of togetherness and so on uh, for many when when it first of all happens when it's quite sudden sudden the short term effects here on this is uh, uh, is that what's often uh, noticed here if you have time to notice that is is there's an elevated startle response a person is experiencing flashbacks and nightmares avoidance of whatever alarms intrusive thoughts and memories while well, you're living in this world now it's all over you if there were enough if there were experts in it they would and not that not that they have time to do this now say oh my goodness that looks like post-traumatic stress disorder and, and of course a syndrome and of course it is often with irritability and impatience and eruptions of attacking energy self-attack and suicidal uh, impulses even in terms of of these kinds of of of, uh, of experiences but some as, as some but what they're actually seeing is the manifestations of this this trilogy this triad of primal separation emotions trying to do their work but having got stuck 
They're trying to solve a problem that isn't being able to be solved to reduce the threat of separation, but it's kind of, it's got stuck. And so what they don't notice is what I'll put in the background here. What isn't noticed and what I want you to notice is that they experience more emotion, but less feeling. Now I put this in the background here. And in fact, we'll cover this up a little bit with some of the more longer term things is, is because this, this is what I want you to remember. When you are seeing in yourselves or in others, this thing, more emotion, but less feeling, and it's not varying during the day, the feelings don't come back, it doesn't have, it's just more emotion, but less feeling. This is when you know uh, it, it, there, there you are experiencing the stress response being stuck. Now, I, I'm just briefly going to put, I'm not going to read through all of it, but all the manifestations of it. Well, maybe I'll read them in just so you can get the idea of, of a separation triggered pursuit. You may see clutching, clinging, possessing, hoarding, acquiring, impressing, pleasing. You can see fragmented fixes and fixations with pursuit as the theme, winning, placing, hunting, chasing, attracting, demanding, reducing, seeking. Uh, preoccupations with altering the self in the pursuit of belonging, love or significance, or preoccupations with concealing oneself. These are more the long-term kinds of things that come. With alarm, of course, there's obsessions, there's compulsions, there's anxiety-reducing behavior. Uh, at a more serious level, there's even an attraction to what alarms. As we get more defended, we feel less. An inability to stay out of trouble, some recklessness and carelessness, a chronic agitation, restlessness, and attention deficits around alarm. And in frustration, uh, there are many different manifestations of this in the younger ones, fits and tantrums, hitting and fighting, obsessions with change, aggression, violence, rudeness, meanness, irritability, impatience, some eruptions of attacking energy. And if it stays too long, even uh, suicidal impulses and self-attack. Now, again, you can hardly see the bottom line here, and it's the bottom line which is important, more emotion but less feeling. This is the bottom line, and this is what I wanted to share with you, because when you know the problem, we, you wouldn't be in teaching if you didn't love children, if you didn't want to make a difference. Well, this is the time that we can make a difference, but it's not the curriculum now. It's not that. It's somehow we need to figure out how to be able to keep this, this stress from becoming struck, rather from becoming stuck and being stuck for years and affecting children. And this is how it can affect for generation upon generation is that there is this state of more emotion but less feeling. And so when we put it all together, what can we do? Well, it may appear rather simple. And it is simple, yes, it doesn't mean easy. But the key to helping students in troubled times, the key to applying relational and emotional first aid is doing the two things that allow a little bit of restoration of feeling that give the brain some rest, that allow it to restore, be, be, give it the equivalent of what sleep would ordinarily do in times when, when sleep was restorative, is it, uh, it keeps the stress from turning into trauma. And so we can, we can literally save our children from becoming the victims, the unwitting victims of this dreadful war. We, to the degree that we can apply relational and emotional help. Now, the helper here, I mean to be anyone, any, anyone who is on hand and a parent, grandparent, relative, uncle, aunt, uh, it, anyone on hand uh, 
if there is a professional available, absolutely neighbor, volunteer, worker, but the teacher, the teacher plays a huge role because the more the student is actually attached to the person wanting to help, the more likely this is going to work. And so hopefully students will have somewhat of an attachment to their teachers. Uh, if not, you can do something about this as well to be able to increase your ability to help them because at this point, it, it will be very, very important uh, to do so. So yes, it's surprisingly simple. It's also intuitive. And so uh, it, it, this is very important because when you're in the middle of chaos, uh, you have to depend upon being able to do something intuitive. You can't do something that uh, that appears too elaborate, that requires a certificate in or anything like that. And so it should feel like an intuitive. The, and, and in fact, as I talk about this, some of you will say, well, that's what I'm doing. That's what exactly what I'm doing. That's what we've been doing at our school. And uh, now you know why why it is. If, if you have intuitive people, they'll be doing these things. But you, you need to know why uh, and, and how you do this. This is also good science to those, uh, any of you who are experts or psychologists who are listening to this, uh, helping professionals. Uh, this is the essence, the distilled essence of the science of, of, uh, of trauma-informed care. And again, the helper can be anyone who wants to help, but the teachers are, in, are so important in this. And these are the first aid kits. Uh, now, I, I, I put first aid kits here because they're meant for first responders, right? And those get, that get to, to the student first. And, and in this case, it will often be you that is able to recognize when a child is in trouble emotionally. Oh my goodness! This kid's this this child's emotions are stuck. The uh, I can see he's highly alarmed, highly frustrated, in intense pursuit. I can see the manifestations of these. I suspect he never gets a chance to get his feelings back. Uh, they, they, there isn't the opportunity to do so. So what can I do? What can I do? And uh, this is what I want to spend the, the rest of our time doing. The, so the, the first, in a sense, uh, 30 minutes here was in presenting the problem. Uh, and that there's some wisdom in what the brain is trying to do. There's an awful lot of wisdom in this. Uh, there's incredible wisdom. If only, if only uh, this distress uh, only was for a couple of days or a week or so on. But that's not the case. This is going on and on and on and on. It's dreadful. It's a perfect storm uh, for getting children into emotional trouble, adults into emotional trouble. And so that's why this is important. So this is the distillation. So, so what can I do? What can I do? How can I be of help? And this is how, how one can be of help, regardless of one's role. But again, the teacher as being the, the first agent of culture and society, uh, the, first, uh, the first one on hand becomes the first responder. In this case, the one who is most likely to help and uh, even uh, the parents will look to, uh, to be able to provide some guidance. And this is how you can help parents be the, the answers their children need. Again, why? Because the answers are intuitive. Uh, they'll know this deep inside, but they won't know that they know it. And so that you can speak to something that is, uh, is already somewhat there. Um, and so we will start off with here, first of all, Convey a strong alpha presence. Why? Well, because attachment is such, it, it's divided into two aspects. We attach either in, 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 an, in a dependent mode to seek to be taken care of, or in an alpha mode to take responsibility for taking care of. That's what creates the dance. That's what creates it. We don't, attachment isn't about equality because survival isn't about equality. Survival is about having, having some people 
adults, teachers, parents, take care of other people, children, students, offspring, the needy, and so on and so on. And so it is that kind of attachment. So it is basically hierarchical. Now, what invites a child to lean on and depend and to be able to receive care is only when you convey a strong alpha presence. And so by a strong alpha presence, I mean that you carrying alpha presence, you, you find that energy deep inside of you. It's as if you, you know, walk into a room, into your class, and you, you just take charge. Now, here's the problem. When you're in a war, we, we all feel like a kind of victims. Uh, this, this is a place when we're out of control. We don't know what's going to happen, what's going to happen the, the next week uh, or the next day, never mind the next week. And so in the middle of, uh, of, of a strike or of an anticipation of a strike, uh, you know, one isn't safe, but this is the point. The point is, it is amazing that children will feel safe when they're attached to somebody and that someone presents themselves as if they are the answer. And that's what it is to be alpha, caring alpha. I will take care of you as if there is the answer. Now, we know we can't guarantee any safety at a time like this. It's the energy that is there. When you convey this alpha presence, when you convey this, you can sense your students relax and they experience being safe, even though they're not safe. Well, why should they feel safe when they're not safe? Well, because it's too long. Because it's the only way the brain can function. It, it's got to find some sanctuary of safety to be able to get some restoration, to get some <laughs> the feelings have to come back to function right. And so we've got to squeeze into the oasis. We got to squeeze into the context of war, rather, a sanctuary, an oasis. And what is that oasis of safety? Is it a bomb shelter? Well, that's from the physical bombs, yes, but that doesn't mean the child feels safe. It what the child feels safe when they're when they are attached to, when they're leaning upon somebody in the alpha mode. This is the power of attachment. That is their sanctuary. Now, it doesn't mean we feel safe. I'm not saying that. We don't need to fool ourselves. What we need is our children, our students to experience this oasis, if just for a bit. We need them to experience this. And so to convey a strong alpha caring presence, regardless of what is happening, collect them, engage the attachment instincts. Now we generally engage the attachment instincts through greetings. You collect the eyes, some smiles, some nods. Nobody feels like smiling exactly. Nobody feels like nodding, but these are the elements of collecting. And they are important because you need to, a child needs to be attached to be able to feel the benefit of that attachment, to be able to feel safe, to be able to lean. And so there's huge power in attachment, huge power. It serves survival even in the middle of danger and of hunger and all of those things. It still serves survival. So do what you can to collect. They, you know, get their eyes, get their eyes to smile, get a few nods, you know, even if it is, oh, this is a bit scary right now, you know, just get them to nod. Because when you do so, you engage the attachment instincts. And it's so important to engage them, keep that relationship there. You know, uh, you need to harness, we need to harness the power of attachment at a time like this come alongside their emotional experience. Now, you might not be able to come alongside the way they're expressing themselves. The greater attacking energy, the greater alarm energy, the irrational fears, the, 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 the intense pursuit, you may not be able to, to come alongside of that. It may make your job harder. But just a gentle word, 
of it, it just it's hard when there's so much frustration it's hard when you can't get that alarm out of your you know the pit of your stomach just a gentle word that goes not to the behavior but comes alongside of the experience lets them know that there's not something wrong with them you know even though they don't feel their 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 right selves there's not something wrong with them uh, so regardless of how odious or exotic the symptoms may be, uh, you know, just need to cut them some slack right now and, 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 and come alongside. Support their existing attachments. You know, we need to take, as a teacher, we need to take a little bit, you know, remember who the mom was, who the dad was, was there a grandma in the scene? Was there a papa? Was there a grandfather? Was, what are the existing attachments? A pet? A few little words about this, you know, uh, that's, that supports these existing attachments you must be thinking of or whatever it is and uh, just support existing attachments. What it is, is that when you hold them dear, it enables them to hold them. And so it connects them to their village of attachment, which is so important right now, because this is the, the village is where we are meant. This is where survival is meant to be. This is the only place it feels right. So support those existing attachments. Now becomes a time uh, that uh, that family becomes part, any part of the family that is there and the pets become part of your world as well, as they're not only your student, but the their survival infrastructure, their things will be those connections. Now, how do you do this? Of course, when, when, when they're experiencing so much separation, they may be separated. Some may be in Poland. Some may be have escaped to Lviv. Some may be in other parts. Uh, how do you do this? How do you do this when there's already an uncle has died? Uh, you know, uh, 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 it goes on and on and on. How, how in the world can you do this? Well, this is where it's important to know how nature does this. And I'll share with you my my roots of attachment after, you know, after many, many years, while well, I've been a therapist for 50 years and the theorist for this, but putting all these pieces together, it, it turns out that the that the the being with this attaching through the uh, uh, senses, this is a plant here with different roots. It turns out that we have different ways of attaching, different roots of attachment. And they're all meant to develop in the first six years of life, so to speak. We start off as babies with being preoccupied with being with, but the way that we can keep close when we're not with is to be the same as. And so just a little statement is, oh, you just, you just have your, your, you know, your, uh, your your uncle's nose or your your aunt's cheekbones or you know, something like this you say something about it or if if they have been separated by death you make a little comment on oh that that, that you know twinkle in your eyes was just the way i knew your grandmother or whatever it is you can just see them relax because what have you done you have preserved their ability to hold on when apart and this is what it's all about. When it comes down to it, what are we as teachers? What are we as clinicians? We're agents of togetherness in a world that is falling apart. We're agents of togetherness. And so we help them hold on, help them with their sense of belonging and their loyalty. Belonging is about being part of it. And loyalty is about being on the same side as, and they need that more than everything. And the longer arms of our attachment are that they matter to those that they're attached to. Oh, if your father could see you now, he'd be so proud of you. That significance. And you feel the attachment there. Oh, you're helping them hold on. You're an agent of attachment. You're helping them hold on. And helping them hold on allows attachment to do its job. Because remember, attachment is for us. This is all about togetherness. It's all about togetherness. 
<laughs> this wouldn't have brought a, such a fierce, loyal response for Ukrainians if it wasn't about togetherness, a culture. It is something that is part of your bones. You need to protect. You need to protect your loved ones. You need to protect this. It's all about attachment here. But we take the same knowledge and help our children hold on, hold on to those that they are facing separation with. The long arm of love through through love because here it is you know your mother is your mother dead or your a uh, dead or alive your grandmother is your grandmother dead or alive why because when there's emotional intimacy the relationship goes forever it never dies that is where we get this permanence this is how the brain helps us to hold on even if there isn't a religion that serves this purpose and most religion does there is this place the relationship doesn't die and that allows us to be able to hold on and so making room for that and understood uh, and seen and so just just listen to anyway these are the ways that they that nature has provided for us to hold on when apart when we become agents of attachment, when that's what our fallback position is, when uh, when when we can't we can't just do things normally anymore, our fallback position here. These are the ways we have to work to say words that help our students hold on to those whom they are attached to. And by the way, it's the same that you can do. You can use sameness by saying we're a lot the same. You and I, we both have our same, you know, this or that or same favorite color. And you'll notice the child is able to hold on to you a whole lot better. You have a lot more attachment power uh, to be able to assist them uh, in this way. Uh, and so it allows it, it allows us to do a lot more emotional first aid. <laughs> It's a time for bridging troubling symptoms with safe connection. There's always a bottom line for a child. You know, at, at this point, that bottom line is more important. When they've done something you disapprove of, when you don't like their behavior, when they're out of line, at this point, it's so important to be able to speak uh, to what stays the same. It's okay. I'm still your teacher. We'll get through this. Uh, and so you speak to the bottom line, you bridge, you bridge whatever threatens to come in between, because what's most important, it's not behavior. What's most important, it's not academic achievement. What's most important, togetherness, togetherness. And so at a time when there's stress, you want to speak to, to, together, to togetherness. And so that doesn't mean that you don't have to point out something that was wrong, but they probably know it anyway. But what, what you do want to do is let them know that you are holding on to them. You know, you are holding on to them, that the relationship is not at stake, that it is stronger. And so just a word at that moment of, of significance, of invitation to exist in your presence, a, a word that has to do with the relationship, that they're important to you, that they matter to you, is going to go a long way. It also preserves the attachment to you so that you can apply this relational first aid. And so it's very important in that way as well. Now, there'll be, there'll be a lot of attachment energy when we're under stress, uh, the attachment neurons just start really humming. And you can take some of that attachment energy and apply and, and invite them to attach to rituals and routines. Now, in times of trouble, when we can't count on anything else, we need to know that the day starts exactly the same way. Then this happens after that happens, and that happens after that happens. And if one of these rituals is about having a snack or whatever it is, make sure that especially at this time, and even if, if, if even better if you can bring some things, is that you create a context of connection before they eat. Uh, why? Well, there's a real physiological reason for this is their stomachs won't work so well uh, when, when it's outside of connection. There'll be a lot of tummy aches. The bodies won't be able to sustain it. But also it communicates to them in a very real way 
<laughs> that I'm taking care of you, that nurturing comes in the context of this context. And so it's at this point, food should not be just perfunctory, something that you just grab for survival's sake. If you can, make sure the food is in the context of connection, if you can, because if you can, it again preserves the sense of uh, the, the body is much able to to bring the nurturance it needs uh, for for it to work and <clears throat> do what you can if 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 you know that there is there is a, a you know an adult an uncle and aunt uh, somebody in in your school who this child could benefit from uh, their family uh, that has suffered losses uh, the adults are not all that dysfunctional if if whenever you can attach a student to an adult who can take them just a little bit under their wing uh, even if it is just emotionally uh, to uh, to create this attachment with a safe adult, it can have a huge effect. Every child at this point in a war, in a crisis, needs to feel somewhat shielded, somewhat taken care of, even if they are not with them. It may be with a grandmother. It may be with an aunt. It may be uh, with an uncle. It may be with a teacher. One of the, the most important uh, research ever to come out was huge. This was over 90,000 adolescents in the in, in United States in a longitudinal study of adolescent health and said, what is the most significant factor in the emotional health and well-being of an adolescent? And this was a longitudinal research. So every year they asked the same question and every year they went through the same thing. And it came out so absolutely uh, uh, undeniable, so absolutely clear that it was the relationship with emotion, uh, an emotional connection with a caring adult. That is what kept their heart safe, even though they were in the middle of crises or uh, in abusive families, or there was there was stress around or uh, refugee children who had suffered from this. This one thing is that a child experiences, again, being safe, even if they can't be around, but when they think of that person, and many of you will have this shielding attachment, some of you with a spouse, some of you with a, a parent, some of you with a grandparent, you will have the shielding attachment that when you think of them, you feel more. You feel more. And that's exactly how it works. The feelings come back. And this is, this is what makes us human and humane. This is what unfolds our potential. This is, this is the essential tragedy of war. It was a tragedy of the Holocaust. It's a tragedy of trauma. It's, they don't feel. We need to feel. No, we can't feel too much. Our suffering is in those feelings. This isn't a time to feel too much. And I don't mean that. We just need to feel a little bit. And if you've got a relationship, if a, a student has a relationship and the thinking about them, they feel a bit more. It is their shield against everything that has happened. You know, it, it, it doesn't keep them out of physical harm's way. No, no, no. But it keeps them emotionally intact. It keeps them, it, pre, it, it preserves them for a better day. Uh, to when when their feelings can come back uh, uh, in in full, uh, but we need to have their hearts before we can protect their hearts. This is the thing, and this is why I said collect them, collect them. Their attachment on you can operate as a stepping stone attachment, taking the weight off of other attachments who may be preoccupied right now. And every, every you know, uh, they may be looking after themselves or their parents or whatever it is uh, that are there. And so we must have their hearts before we can protect their hearts. So again, so important in this is the, the purpose of attachment. It is powerful. If this is an oasis. This is the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary we can build in the middle of war. 
This is a sanctuary, and this is the investment in the future generation of our children. This is how, how we can help them do more than survive. Uh, we can help them to preserve that place where the feelings will come back uh, when, when there is a safety to do so. Now, this is our way, basically, uh, this is our way of being able uh, to, uh, to, oops, just a minute, push the wrong button here. This is our way to be their answer, even when there are no answers. This is the way to, and, and the key thing I want to point out here is, is it isn't being. You say, well, how am I going to remember to do all of this? I'm going to do this. Well, remember, it, it, it's not so much what you do. Nature's already taking care of this. If you, if you, if the child can in any way attach to you, lean on you, uh, if if that if if the attachment is in place, the the power of attachment will do the rest. It's not in doing or saying or knowing the right things. What it is is empowered by the child's attachment to us. And again, the stories, the stories I've heard over and over again of the survivors of war, it, it is in this attachment that the safety is, that the sanctuary is. It allows us to be their home when, when we have no homes, when our homes have been destroyed, our, our physical homes have been destroyed. We can be there. We can still be their home. We can be their place of rest, even when there is nothing but unrest around us. We can be their place of rest. We can be their sanctuary of safety, even when safety does not exist in, in any physical way, at least. We can be their shield in a wounding world, even though we can't stop uh, what is happening from happening. And we can be their reason for holding on. Uh, oh, my goodness, what we would do out of attachment, you know, just that little bit more energy, just just holding on uh, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like, oh, I just can't do this anymore. It's for attachments that we hold on. It's for love that we hold on. It's for connection that we hold on. It's for togetherness that we hold on. And so this is a way of being their answer when, as I said, uh, you know, it, 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 there really aren't, there's not a way of, of, of stopping this that we can figure out. And, and again, the, the beauty of this is in just being, it's, it's who the teacher is to a student at a time like this, not what the teacher does or the teacher says or the teacher knows or the teacher is able to teach them. It is who the teacher is to the student, and that is a matter of attachment that allows that attachment to serve its purpose. Let, let me move to the, to the second, the second uh, emotional first aid kit is play. Now, there's a whole emergent science of play in, in the last uh, two decades. It's just amazing. I love it. I spent a lot of time putting the pieces together of this. I have courses about it and uh, three courses that I've created about it. I, I, it's just amazing. Right underneath our noses was an answer to this. Now, the kind of play I'm talking about here is a play that's not outcome-based, you're not trying to get some places, play for play's sake. It's not about toys. It's not about sports. It's not about physical playgrounds. Think of it more as where emotions get to play in music and theater and art and drama. It is playing when you're pretending to be somebody else in your imagination. It's when emotions are play. And so this is the kind of play <coughs> that we mean. Now, Play really is nature's secret. It's, it's how nature takes care of our emotions. It's, uh, it's just amazing. 
Uh, all mammals play, all mammals need to play. Children will continue to play in the middle of the war and they need to play. And we need to find that play in us as well. Otherwise we'll get burnt out very quickly. We need to find that play. Uh, so the same thing applies to us as well. Uh, why do we need to do so? Well, first of all, the power of play. And I, I've represented play as a bubble here. And I've, I've just put these images together. You, you'll, you'll get them. Uh, you'll maybe even have witnessed some of them. Is that the absolute miraculous, incredible power of play to bring into a bubble in the middle of, of destruction. This is what is possible when a child is in the play mode. Why? Well, there's three drives, basically, uh, three major drives. There's the attachment drive, which we talked about. It's the preeminent one. It's about survival. There's the achievement drive uh, that is about getting someplace. It's about outcomes. It's about accomplishment. It's about work. And there's a play drive. Now the play drive is what is there to give the rest from the others. The play drive is an instinct in every single one. And when it's activated, it's like the other two drives don't exist for a moment. And it gives rest from that relentless pursuit. And I also included a picture here that will be more close at home for you. Uh, the Neufeld Institute uh, sponsors a project with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Ukrainian mothers and children in, in Poland, uh, in, in Poland through our faculty member there. And one of her colleagues drew this because that's, they are basically applying relational and, and emotional first aid, uh, play and relationship with a program there uh, uh, for the, the refugee mothers and, and children who are part of this. And again, this bubble, this bubble again in these wonderful Ukrainian colors uh, that uh, I've tried to maximize in my garden right now uh, in the spring, uh, just uh, help keep you in mind and memory uh, at all times. Um, but this is, this is the power, the absolute power of play. So what does it do? What does it do? Well, it safely engages us and it distracts us in alarming situations. Well, should children be distracted? Yes, and so do we need to be sometimes. So do we, our brain needs a break. It needs a break. So yes, yes, it, it, the brain in the play mode, like, how can I explain this? Is sleep is to cognition as play is to emotion. Now, if we don't get enough sleep, we know that we can't think straight. If we don't get enough play, our emotions can't do their work. We can't feel them. They can't, our emotions are there for a purpose. So again, I'll say that play is to emotion. And now we all need to play. We all need to play, all of us. This is, this is, how, this is how we become from, uh, uh, keep from becoming victims of Play is to emotion as sleep is to cognition. It gives the brain a chance to rest and recover. Again, just like sleep does, we aren't meant to go straight over and over again. We've got to have this rest. We've got to have this recover. So we've got to find our emotional playgrounds we had as our youth. We've got to do this uh, it, to provide for safe expression of primal emotion. Our emotions are raging, our frustration, our alarm. Our, our proximity uh, in intense pursuit uh, emotions are, are, are raging. And so these need to have safe expression. Uh, unfortunately, th these emotions aren't doing much to fix the problem, uh, but they've got to go someplace. Once an emotion is charged, it's charged. It's, it's, it, we know now it's an electrical charge. When it's charged or charged with a job or a purpose, it's got to be expressed somehow. That's the first law of emotion. And if we don't give it expression, then it's going to take, uh, take uh, it can express itself in ways that aren't necessarily going to be constructive. Uh, to lighten the emotional load, uh, play allows the load to, to, to lighten, even though the circumstances don't change. Play will allow this, oh my goodness, you see a child in play and you go, 
how how can how can they even laugh at a time like this how can it be there but the same thing is for us when we find the music that allows our emotions to be expressed we find uh, we uh, you know we 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 find the the art that gives expression to our emotion to aid in the recovery of feelings so that the stress response does not get stuck well this is the whole point right the whole point is that we don't become victims of the war the whole point is that the war doesn't win they i mean in the sense that the 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 objectives of the enemy d doesn't win uh, that it doesn't break break the people that it doesn't break the children, that it, that it doesn't get visited as war often does into the second and third generations. It is, is, and what is the answer? It's in the recovery of feelings. It's all in the recovery of feelings. And, and this is something we can do something about. This is actually something that we, and as I said, teachers are in the front lines here, absolutely in the front lines to set the stage to access healing sadness when emotionally ready ultimately for healing and recovery there will need to be a lot of sadness if you feel sad whenever the futility sinks in of what 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 you couldn't change what you couldn't do what you couldn't help where where things didn't work and so sadness is simply the feeling of futility and when it's a big thing it comes with tears tears of futility there'll be a time for this there is no way of healing without tears and when you finally there is some safety then it will be time for the sadness to come but right now you're just holding holding space for it uh setting the stage for it it's giving a little bit of time for the a rest from from the high alarm frustration uh just a little emotional oasis that is there when drawing the child into play, we are transferring the child into the arms of nature so it can gently and wisely take care of the child. Again, play is incredible. We thought it was innocuous, something just frivolous, something that children did, but we didn't understand it. Now we know it is nature incognito and much more than that. It is the way nature will take care of us in times of war, in times of crisis. It will take, child, take care of a child in the middle of abuse happening, in the middle of trauma happening. It's, uh, it's the way that uh, play can take care of, uh, of, of us. Now this here, I just tried to capture, I, I borrowed this piece of art here of uh, what I imagine play taking care of, of our heart here, of our emotion. So uh, allows us to feel a bit. And this is where the emotional playgrounds uh, come in, uh, where they are so important. Uh, is uh, and and again, it is amazing how how play can do this. And I'll just go through the reasons. If you know, many of you are have an academic mind, so you need to understand what is behind all of this. Maybe to 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 apply this. And so, how does this work? Well, when emotions are not at work, the inhibition of feelings is reversed. So automatically, you feel a bit more. Uh, Play is safe, so feelings won't get hurt. Now, when a child is in play, play is an incredible, it, it takes care of, so it, it, it won't allow the feelings that are too much to come yet. If the sadness is too much because their suffering is in sadness, it won't come yet. It won't come yet, but it's safe in play. Play will take care of this. Emotions are freer to move and so more likely to be felt and identified. <clears throat> So feelings are easier to feel when one step removed from real life. And oh my goodness, that is true. And that is why it's more necessary than ever. Words or their lack did not get in the way. This, this is beyond words. We don't have words for it. What do you say? The words get choked and yet the feelings need to come. So words or their lack do not get in the way. And the feeling specifically involved in strengthening the self, which is sadness ultimately, because when we feel sad about the things we haven't been able to fix or change our emotions and so on, 
it strengthens us to be able to live in those circumstances. And that is part of the work of sadness. If sadness has, has, does the work of healing, of recovery, uh, but again, it needs a bit of space. It doesn't have that space now. Uh, and, uh, and so right now it, it just, we're hold, it needs to be, a space needs to be held for this. Uh, again, I, I, I brought in this picture just to be able to look at the different kinds of, of emotional playgrounds. You'll recognize them as culture, of course. This is culture. And there is no more important time for culture than now. Singing the songs of one's culture, wearing the dress of one's culture, doing the dances of one culture, doing the theaters, telling the stories, because this is where the emotions play. This is where they come out. There is no more important time for this. So whatever it is, this is where everything, you know, whatever you have, instruments in the school, the music, you know, the, the, the music rooms are open. This is where the children are invited to make music and invited into crafts, invited into, this, this is where you, you just make possible whatever it is that play can happen and emotions can find some relief, some safety uh, uh, in this. And uh, so some suggestions for how to do this. Well, engage in play by giving play signals. Uh, usually a child needs a play signal. This is why the clown's nose is so important. You put the nose on and okay, this is playtime. Uh, all animals or mammals have placed signals. That, that's what's important because it's a bubble. You need to know when you go into it and when you come out of it. And uh, so uh, a little bit of silliness, uh, uh, singing, uh, wearing a playful cape, any of these things will say to the child, oh, I, you know, I'm invited to play. I can take a break from the reality right now, the reality that is chaotic, that is unsafe, that is alarming, that is frustrating, and so on. And I am invited to play. And so finding these ways to be able to invite this play, engage in games, puzzles, stories, having the puzzles there, reading time, snack time, if you can read to them, if the children are young enough and so on, is, is you have the stories, music, 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 dance, 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 dance. Uh, if there are little dramas or theaters, anything like this will be there. Don't be surprised if all they want to do is play war. This, this, this is what happens. I, when my neighbor across the street from me, when I grew up, uh, uh, we were both uh, born in, uh, well, he was born two years, three years younger than I, or uh, no, uh, before I, I was born in 1946. Uh, I had my father after the First World War. My neighbor did not have his father. He was killed. He was uh, in the Air Force and he was downed. And uh, and, you know, as I got to be three and four years of age, every time I went to Teddy Campbell's place, uh, we played war, digging trenches, um, you know, gunning down planes. I, I must have done it for, for eight years straight. Little did I know that I was actually applying first aid, that I was a helper in this. I was an aide uh, being able to help play, work out all of these things. Sometimes it takes a while as uh, some of these spontaneous plays, but you'll see what it is that needs to come out and that they need to play it over and over and over again. Provide materials to draw, paint, construct, make crafts, make music, priming the activity when necessary. Again, this may seem, well, it's not academic. No, no, it's not. It's not academic. This is not a time when the child is asking, oh, I'd like to figure out how the atom works. Yeah, you know, I'd like to, I, I'd like to remember, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, how chemistry works or biology. Uh-uh. No, it's a time togetherness, togetherness. Emotions are high and the emotions need rest. Play is what is required. Take turns telling made up stories so their emotions can drive something other than nightmares. 
Uh, the more that they can tell the stories, the less those stories will haunt them at night. Sing or hum lullaby type songs if possible. Uh, the lullaby type songs are often in the key of sadness, usually in a minor. You find yourself humming them and there is an incredible quietness that comes over the people who are hearing. It's also the first, uh, the lullaby is our first connection uh, for the newborn uh, because we actually connect to the music rather than to the words as a, as a fetus. It brings a sense of well-being that is deep. And so just acting as you know, just going about your way and sometimes hunging, singing or humming some of these things can you actually see the effect on the children near you, the emotional power and connective power. Engage in playful connection, providing brief experiences of contact and togetherness that are able to disarm, especially if there's a lot of resistance to connection. Do it in play. Use play as a primer if you need to for relationship. Play is ultimately engaging. And so if the child's uh, students are resisting contact and connection, you can usually break through this in the play mode. And of course, engage in lots of cultural play, dances, music, art of their culture of origin right now, especially important uh, to, uh, this is when the culture, which is the emotional playground of a people is a culture. And so right now we need the emotional playground. The Ukrainians need their emotional playgrounds of their culture, not only children, adults. All of this that I say that is true of children is true of us as well. It is absolutely true of us to be able to keep from being victims. Uh, of of the war, what do children? The uh, uh, what emotions need to play? What will you see? What can you look for? Well, provide opportunities to play out alarm as well as alarming scenarios while uh, safely in the context of play. If you play a, a alarm, a monster, you know, a, whatever the age is, whatever the age appropriate. Wow, do you notice how much they want to play it over and over again while in the context of safety? Alarm is working itself out. Uh, give residual frustration some playful expression by games of construction or destruction. Uh, that's important. Lots of uh, room for construction and room for destruction as well. Uh, give alpha instincts expression through playing the leader, the boss, the superhero, the rescuer, the one in charge. You'll see this happening in their spontaneous play. Give separation trigger pursuit safe expression through games or activities characterized by the hunt, the chase, the find. Uh, these are normal child games that now you'll see them spontaneously going into. It will give you the idea of why they need to do so, because this is how it's played out. Provide plenty of opportunity for pretending to be someone or something else uh, that is also will be higher at this time and give dependent instincts safe expression through playing the baby, the pet, the sick, the wounded, the one in need of care. Uh, some children will be playing alpha. Some children will be playing the opposite, the dependent. Again, either one has has a place uh, for uh, for doing this. If a child has really gone into regression, uh, allow them that regression in play to play the baby, to play the pet, and give them the attention, the care they're seeking for here. Well, brings me to our last slide. <coughs> Again, I, I tried to put it as simple as I could, the image, applying relational emotional first aid, play and relationship. Uh, the teachers being in this, in this sense, uh, uh, come to be frontline workers. Um, first responders, so to speak. They're first on hand because they see children. They see children, be, uh, you know, becoming the victims of war before their, their eyes. And this is where we can, we teachers can play a huge part. It, it is simple. And it can be so simple that it's easy to miss. I think it's more complicated than it is. Now, it is simple. It's also intuitive. And by simple, I don't mean easy. But it is doable. And it's also intuitive. As, as I said in the beginning, some of you are doing exactly this and didn't know why you were doing it or why someone was doing it in your school or your administrator was leading you in this. 
It is because it's intuitive. But now when you know why it needs to happen, hopefully it can give extra affirmation and be a reminder. Nothing could be more important than at this time. You know, nothing could be more important than play. It's, 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 it's so paradoxical, right? So paradoxical. <clears throat> and nothing could be more important when survival is at stake than relationship because it is how our brains are programmed. So again, I believe teachers have one of the most important roles to play. You not only have your relationship with the students directly, but you can also help support their parents and helping their parents be who their children need at this time, the answers to their children. And as I said, war often claims several generations of victims, even if your side wins. In this case, it's all about making sure that our children are not the victims of war that uh, when safety finally comes, they'll be able to have the sadness to recover, but their brains need to be able to be functioning well enough, their emotional brains, uh, it, it's so they need, uh, need enough rest, need enough emotional health, uh, that the recovery will take place spontaneously when there's time. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to share these things. I hope I've been able to share them in a way that is usable for you, that affirms you, that uh, gives you energy, uh, gives you it gives you direction, gives you focus on how to use your role in society uh, for the best in uh, in this horrific time. Uh, so thank you, and I'll stop uh, s s uh, sharing my screen right now, and uh, I think we'll make way for some questions. Hordon, thank you so much. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, comments in our chat and a lot of people just write you thank you, thank you, thank you in all languages. So you can uh, see these after our webinar. Uh, but now I would like to ask our participants to give uh, us questions because we have time to answer uh, your questions connected to our topic. Um, I will change my language to Ukrainian to read our comments. And Maria, I would like to ask you to translate these comments to Gordon and vice versa. Okay, the first question is, чи можливо більше сказати про фразу? Більше емоцій, менше відчуттів. Якісь конкретні приклади, що цю фразу можуть проілюструвати? Окей, um, okay. фраза була насправді the opposite. More emotion and less feeling. Окей, okay. not, not, not more feeling and less emotion. Uh, more emotion and less feeling uh and and and, and again i uh, it's it's not that hard if if you think of of um of feelings uh, as being the kind of, of feedback in our brain that comes from uh, the uh, uh, what's happening in our body and this feedback is a luxury so what happens in our body is an automatic response to many things. We can be very, very frustrated. We can be very afraid. We, we can, and again, the best way of thinking of it is actually as our hunger is, is, uh, uh, is that in, in, in a time of crisis, you, you, you can think that, uh, that your, your house has been shelled, uh, bombed. And you have loved ones in that house. And, and you may have been sick the day previous. You may have had aches and pains. You may be very hungry. You may be extremely tired. You don't feel any of those things. You don't feel any of those things. Now, are they not true? Yes, they are true. But in a time of crisis, the brain goes, we have no time for feedback, no time for feedback, no time for feedback. Feedback, not yet. I, the, the brain goes, I have to move this person to do his job, to do her job. What does she have to do? So 
High pursuit, find my loved ones, rescue them. High frustration, solve the problems I need to do to get this done. High, you know, high alarm, be moved to caution, but I don't feel it because to feel my alarm would be way too vulnerable if I was too vulnerable. So in my attempts to save my, my, my people, I may get hurt, I may get burnt, I may do this, I won't even know that. I can go into and somebody says you're bleeding. I wouldn't even know I was bleeding. Why? Because the brain says this is not a time to process feedback. Feelings are the feedback of what is happening in our body. Now, when, and so that feedback gets lost. That's what happens in post-traumatic stress syndrome is there is no feedback. So all of these things, almost everything that is, that can go wrong in terms of, of mentally, emotionally, it has to do with a simple equation, more emotion and less feeling. So the idea of this, of course, is that in everyone's life will be an emotional sanctuary, an emotional playground, a safe relationship that they'll be able to get to in time for the feedback still to be connected. If it's too long, the feedback can't be connected. So then it's just general kinds of things. And we have to go to play for just general kinds of, of things because there's no words. This, they're not connected again. But that's basically how, how it works is our brain is very regulated to, is there the luxury of feeling what is happening inside right now? No, there's no luxury for it. Okay, shut it off, shut it off, shut it off. There's work to do, there's work to do. And, and so that's just how our brain works. Hopefully that, that helps. Дякую, Гордоне. Тоді наступне питання від пані Тетяни. Які емоції першими потрібно програвати? Тривогу і що далі? Um, this, this is no, there's no order. If, if everything is very clean, if everything is for a child, you know, is, is, is the, the, the first emotion usually that tries to fix a problem is, is usually a pursuit to close the gap, but it, they get all so mixed up. They, they just rotate when one gets stronger than the other. So no, uh, you, uh, you couldn't really make rhyme or reason for this. As soon as you provide some safety and some play, the emotions that need to come out of a child will, but you'll notice that they will change. They, they, if they're drawing pictures, if they're doing playing games, it'll be alarm based, and you know, then it might go to frustration based or pursuit based. But th there's not necessarily an order th that you could generalize uh, at all. Дякую. І тут просто дуже близьке питання, тому я. Поставлю його поза чергою. Як можна програти сценарій тривоги? Остання тема, яку розказали. Полювання про маленьку тварину пораненого. Якщо можна, і з прикладами. Well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of how you would do it for a young child. Young children want to play alarm all the time. You know, uh, you know, Papa, will you be the monster? Can you, you know, chase me? You, you create a safe area like a you know, bed, and then you, you, you feign this. Ah, I'm gonna get you. You know, you, you, you do this alarm. Uh, now, uh, now, kids will play this automatically. They'll create a safe place, and then they'll be, you know, their place of unsafety where where they're gonna get, and they'll play it over and over and over again, and so they'll spontaneously go into games where they're alarmed, they're startled, like you, you surprise them and are startled, but they're safe. They're safe because they're in play. And because they're safe, the alarm will go over and over and over and over again. They'll want to play it over and over and over and over again. It, it, but the, the key thing is, is that it's safe. As soon as it's not safe, it backfires. Immediately, the game will stop and the child will, will cry out upset or whatever it is. It will be too much, but it has to go, uh, go into this. And so there's always 
uh, there's uh, again you can take the hint from spontaneous plays, but it's it's always the sense where 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 if an adult is playing, if an adult is actually doing this, yeah, uh, you you create a, some some threat that's done in the play voice and the play way, and uh, uh, so most chasing games are 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 this way is as well. When I get it, when I'm going to get you, you know, they're 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 just uh, they're they're alarm, but always alarm in the place of safe safety. And when it is, it's titillating for children. They the brain says, "Oh, I can take this. I can take this. I, I get a rest from real alarm." You know. Дякую дуже. А, так. Тоді повернуся до попереднього питання. А, Гордоне, чи є якісь практичні поради по онлайн-комунікації з учнями? А, листування або уроки в Zoom, наприклад? О, oh, I, I, I don't know about that. Uh... Well, the the normal boundaries they kind of dissolve. Uh, they're not the same as when everything goes according to normal. You know, you want to make sure that you the boundaries aren't crossed, so you stay as a teacher and and uh, and maintain your your professional demeanor and so on. Uh, when when we move to agents of of attachment, when we move to take care of their emotions, it's a little bit different uh, than that, and I I I don't know how to answer that. I I, I think that probably would be answered in in uh, uh, you know in in uh, in each uh, each school having a bit of discussion with uh, with uh, teachers that may be having some of the same questions, but. I, I I would hesitate. The cultures are so different. The circumstances are so different that I, I would hesitate to uh, to actually give advice when when uh, 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 for you in that. But I, I'm sure that answers can be found. Uh, just just remember that this is not normal times. Uh, so don't try to get things that that uh, would fit for when. Uh, when you can count on what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after. Дякую дуже. А наступне питання звучить таким чином: які завдання можна давати підліткам, щоб допомогти їм проживати емоції? Наприклад, писати твори на тему війни нормально? Um, no, no, that, that's not going to serve. First of all, a task is not going to serve because a task is outcome based is still is having to do something right, having to have a good outcome. Play is play. Um, it uh, is, is, is not a task. Uh, giving a task is is you don't know what you're touching. Uh, you have no idea what, you, what, what you're touching there. And, and the, the thing about play is, is only what will, in play, what comes out is ready to come out. It's always gentle. Play is gentle. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't prod emotionally. Um, so uh, I, I, I can see where the question is, is, you know, to, to get it written out. Uh, yes, but it would be much better to 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 give a time where you can set the stage with writing a poetry or a short story, something that isn't going to be graded, something that is just comes out of like, you, you know, if you were an artist and what comes to you in a playful way, like like to to just allow it so there's no right or wrong, the content isn't required. 
and then when 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 the war needs to come into it or the touching of the loss of it or whatever it comes in a playful way and so it's finding that stage where it is a playful activity but a playful activity is that it doesn't count for real and that's the whole purpose of it and so this is you know enough work today you say so that's always a signal you know enough work today we've we've done our work today I, I I feel the urge to kind of access my more more artistic side. You may say to yourself, to your students, uh, uh, if you care to join me, uh, grab a piece of paper. I, I, I uh, some of you, I'm sure there's a poet inside of you someplace, or maybe in some of you there's a you know there's a there's a, a writer or a, or a drawer. You know, we've done enough work today. So you try to set the stage to allow uh, something that's more playful to emerge, uh, and you have to trust that what comes in at that time is what needs to come. In my experience, I worked for years with prisoners who were uh, adolescents who were under dire circumstances their life was full of stress living in a prison is no fun never mind the homes it came to and this is the way i would uh, apply it uh, you know to them is uh okay we've done our session today because they were sent for their sessions right but i was kind of wondering what your your favorite music is uh you know let's play a game i'll 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 hum a tune see if you can recognize it we probably have different music and you suit let's see if we can you know do this but i you know you, you, you find a way to set the stage so the so they feel as if okay it doesn't count this is the bubble this is the bubble and in the bubble nature takes care of of the kids and that's what you're depending on you're just handing them over to nature to take care the the, the thing about this and, and it's what i want to mention and emphasize you see some of these things have been known for a long time in play therapy but in play therapy it's all focused around the therapist in an actual fact play doesn't need a therapist play does a therapy so if a child plays in the middle of the forest, it still does its, it still does its job, though nobody has witnessed it. So this is all it requires. Just trust that nature will take care. You just set the stage. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to know it. You don't have to know the content. They don't have to hand it in. What you're doing is you're providing nature to take care of your children so they don't become the victims of what is happening. So it really has to do and why I shared about how it works is so that you can trust nature to do its job so that you don't have to feel like you have to be on top of this. You don't have to be on top. You just have to deliver the children into the hands of nature of uh, in this case of play. And that's a beautiful part of it is is you find some way of doing it equally important for teens as it is, you know, for the four and five year olds. It's, it's important all the way. Дякую. Наступне питання таке. Чи важлива кількість учасників гри? Um, no, not, not, not really. I mean, it may, it may matter to a particular child, like it may be too much, but it, it doesn't really, really matter for play to do its work. It, 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 it doesn't matter. It can be very, very, uh, it can be in solitude. It can be in a large group as uh, it would in a concert, you know, where you have a large group watching, you know, children uh, play the music or dance the music and their emotions and so on, inviting them to do so, you know. So no, no, it doesn't. Thank you. Далі таке питання. Якщо дитина боїться вимовляти слова Путін, Росія, російська мова, як правильно пояснити, що це лише слова? I didn't quite get the question. Could you say it again? <coughs> Якщо дитина боїться вимовляти слова Путін, Росія, російська мова, як правильно пояснити, що це лише слова? Uh, 
Well, that's a little bit too teacherish. Teacher being too much of a teacher. Like that's what I'm trying to say here is take a break in your teaching. You, 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 you're trying to teach about symbols, teach about words. You know, I, that's why I said, come alongside. You know, it's scary to say some words sometimes. It, it feels like wrong to come alongside the emotion of it. You, you, don't, you don't have to fix this. You don't have to teach it. Just come alongside. Acknowledge the fact that it is. The emotion is the reality that is important now, not your curriculum not your not your way of doing things the emotion is what is important this child for whatever reason has to say avoid those words why because if he says them maybe the danger will come he is admitting something i don't know i don't know what it is and you don't need to know all you need to do is let your heart go out to him come alongside with uh, just acknowledging the emotion. Sometimes it, it's scary. It doesn't feel right to say certain words. That child knows that they're understood. It gives permission for them to be where they are. Uh, it may be worked out, but this, this he, he wouldn't, he's not, not saying them because he doesn't have the right conceptual ability to differentiate words from their meanings. He's not saying them because he's because there's some emotion that is there and so the emotion is what needs to come come uh to for you to come alongside дякую маємо кілька схожих питань тому я їх так згрупую в одне де брати ресурси для гри саме у дорослої людини або як виходити до дітей у гру, коли ти сам як дорослий, як учитель, або як мама, тато, не маєш ресурсу в собі для цього? Um. Well, I'll, I'll just I'll just feed back again what I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just be a therapist here for a moment. So what, what I sense in that question is, is, uh, is, is a person trying to figure something out? They're trying to, to figure it out. And the answer actually lies in finding your own playfulness yourself. Because when you find your own play, that is where all one's creativity lies. When we're trying to figure it out with our head, when we're trying to figure this out, we lose the way through here. There's not the, the, the answers don't lie in this conceptual you know, how does one do this? It lies in finding the place where I feel a bit playful, and that is what preserves my creativity to be able to, you know, to be creative at the moment. And so the answer here would be to engage others in play. I may first need to find a little bit of playfulness myself and to be able to invite, to be able to get out of this work mode, this conceptual mode all, all the time. You know, if I can find that, that bit of silliness, a twinkle in my eye or something there, be surprising how creative that I can actually become. Thank you very much. Наступне питання, ми знову так повертаємося до дітей, до роботи тут трошки з підлітками. Як допомогти підлітку, який вже не хоче грати? Можливо, ще якісь техніки можна застосовувати? Це дуже добре питання. 
the 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 bottom line here the we can never make anybody play we cannot even make ourselves play we can find it we can discover it we can invite it we can encourage it but we cannot make anybody play and and that's important that we can't it, it it's never coercive and so how do you make it then enticing when I was working in the prison, I would have a few things like puzzles in my office. And sometimes I would just go and walk and I would put a piece in or I would try to get, you know, another puzzle doing or uh, or, you know, uh, you have a piece of drawing, you put a doodle on and, and, you, and you so on and, and you, 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 you have some things, you, you, you set the stage, so to speak, uh, uh, with a musical, you know, with some, some drums, some musical instruments, some, some things, you know, you, you try to find the person's bent to what you think it would be. And, and you just have that around uh, more uh, so that it sets the stage. I, I, there's no secret, I think, to make anybody play because you can't. And we won't be able to save everyone, uh, but we can make it a lot easier. And so it's, it's setting the stage with it, having some of the props around that, uh, that would be more engaging. Thank you. Тут мені слідь таке вже логічне питання до цього. На вашу думку, як, які ритуали або рутини мають терапевтичний ефект? Що ми можемо використовувати з повсякденного для саме такої терапії? О, мене має бути з музикою. There is the, the, the music that I go to, uh, that, uh, that I, I used to be able to play piano a lot more and I would go to my piano and I would just, I just play, uh, play out my emotions and allow that to change however it changed. Uh, but now, now it's music. When I go too long without, uh, not background music, but music that you enter into, you immerse yourself into. If I go too long with that, I become a bit grumpy and irritable and I can, I can feel my, uh, my exhaustion uh, and so on. So th those are what my routines and rituals, I, you know, ideally I would make time for that uh, every day. Uh, I, I'm much more human when I allow the music to take care of my emotions. I, I'm, I'm a better father and a grandfather and a, and a, th a you know, therapist and a theorist, but it's, it's music for me. Thank you. Два останні питання, і обидва мені здаються складними, але спробуємо. В умовах війни, які індикатори стануть діагностичними для відслідковування того, що в дитини притупляється емоційне сприйняття? Well, the, that's the um, diagram that I used about the manifestations of high alarm or high frustration or high pursuit. Uh, and so when you see those manifestations there, it means that uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the stress response is stuck, the emotions are stuck, they keep on trying to, to, uh, 
uh, they're there, but there is no release from them. And so that's why I gave, you can see the manifestations there of alarm-based uh, manifestations, of pursuit-based manifestations, and of um, frustration-based manifestations. Uh, on the opposite of it, uh, the indicators of health are uh, the best indicator of health is that when a child gets to uh, one of these emotional sanctuaries, uh, uh, it can experience uh, a, a relational uh, uh, sanctuary or a, a emotional playground is the feelings do come back. You can see that the feelings come back. That's always the health that you can see. And if they have this, that is part of their, their life at least uh, once a week and so on is that it really is there you know that they are that uh, that they're at least that they're emotionally as is healthy and as functional as they could be in that that situation when when there is no change when there is just that there is no change in this uh, the uh, the there is no ebb and flow to the feelings uh, then you know a child is in trouble and same with yourself you know you're in trouble when you when you get you know home or you get to your loved ones and it you know there's no change you feel listless and restless and agitated and the feelings don't come you you know that there's a bit of stuckness you you need to find more emotional play for some softening so it's the same thing it's, there should be a normal ebb and flow Дякую. І останнє питання, Маша, можливо, тобі для зручності, воно є і українською, і англійською мовою. Це останнє питання в чаті від Лариси Барановської. Я його зачитаю українською вище, а ти можеш гордо тоді просто прочитати коментар англійською. Є діти, які з великою ненавистю за агресією. I don't have the chat. Yeah, I, I don't have the chat on here. Okay. Okay, I can okay. copy. Ah, okay. Um, Є діти, які з великою ненавистю, з агресією говорять слова «росіяни», «росія», їх треба вбити, бо вони зло. Як максимально згладити ці повідомлення, особливо коли в групі є діти з Росії? Oh, I, I, I lost the translator here. How come I'm not hearing the translator? Маша, ми тебе чуємо зараз. На російській, на українській. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, this is a this is a, a a good example when as as a teacher you want to lead the way through, and where the words are ones of hatred, but they come from being incredibly frustrated, and so you can come alongside of the frustration, and and it's in coming along the side of the frustration where this is very frustrating this isn't working right now all you know all, all you can think of is the bad words to say about uh, you know about the enemy and when when you actually say it in a way that that can come alongside of the frustration without taking a judgment on it but giving them the way to be able to say it what you would like them to say is all I can think of is bad words for, you know, for, uh, for the enemy. I, you know, like you, you, you would to bring it to another level, but the frustration is where you come alongside of and speaking it in a way that would be okay for you to speak to that emotion at that, at that time. This is this is always the difficulty as as teachers trying to lead individuals out of uh, out of a a very dangerous polarization of humanity. However, 
we're incredibly frustrated. And as and so to be able to come alongside that frustration is where we can come alongside with without uh, without judgment and and help lead the way with words that would express that frustration that would be okay for you to hear. I know this is a complex thing, but basically the bottom line is you always start with the emotion is okay, the emotion is okay, the emotion is okay. It is the way it's being manifest that's not okay. And so you come alongside the emotion and that allows you then to be able to give an alternate expression that would be okay with you. Uh, it must be incredibly hard at a time like this to try and find it. I'm not saying that's easy, but that basically is the, what you try, try to do to, to, uh, to do that. Друзі, я вам дякую. Я на початку хочу подякувати Гордону, бо я казала це на початку. Мені було надзвичайно приємно і неочікувано, і важливо місяць тому, трошки, мабуть, менше, отримати листа від Гордона та його команди про те, що вони хочуть провести вебінар для українського вчительства на тему, на яку ми сьогодні зустрілися. Гордона, я від лиця всіх тих, хто був сьогодні з нами, нас зараз 160, до того було 180, 190 учасників, Хочу подякувати за те, що ви приділили нам час і сьогодні у Гордона ще ранок, о 8 ранку прийшли до нас провести ефір, поговорити з українським вчительством і батьківством про ті речі, які у нас болять, насправді болять. Це велика честь для нас і я дуже-дуже сподіваюся, що та співпраця, яку ми заклали 23 лютого за один день війни відбувся наш перший вебінар, сьогодні в нас, в нас другий вебінар – то я дуже сподіваюся, що ця співпраця дасть yes. собі плоди для українського суспільства. Yes. Mm. Well, thank you again for giving me this opportunity. I, I uh, this tentatively reached out because I, I don't know if you operating, you can operate and any of this. I'm, I'm glad and glad that you were able to provide uh, uh, the opportunity to, for me to reach out and try to, to be a bit of help. I'm sure you're on our hearts and minds all the time. So thank you. Дякую. І також хочу подякувати нашим учасникам, які не зважаючи на війну, сьогодні ввечері прийшли навчатися, прийшли брати нову інформацію до розуму, до серця, аби вже завтра приходити до онлайн-класів і працювати з дітьми по-новому, з новими акцентами, з новим розумінням того, як ми можемо підтримати дітей наразі у складні часи. Я дуже вдячна тим, хто був сьогодні з нами. Ви а, завтра отримаєте від мене листа розсилку. Я вам надішлю і запис ефіру із Гордоном і невеличкий хендбук, в якому будуть збережені слайди, з якими можна працювати, і інформацію про сертифікати. Тому, друзі, просто дякую за те, що ви такі круті. А я зараз зроблю маленький анонс, користуючись правом організатора. Ми маємо ще одну круту подію найближчим часом, рівно за два тижні, і з нами зустрінеться Барбара Оуклі, та сама авторка курсу «Вчитися в вч... Чи... Навчити вчитися, вибачте, трошки важко вже з англійською і українською, то ми також запрошуємо вас і на вебінар із Барбарою Огуклі. І також я хочу подякувати Марії, яка була сьогодні нашою перекладачкою, яка забезпечує нам переклад з англійської на українську і навпаки. Марія, дуже тобі дякую за те, що з тобою кожен переклад є таким емоційним, живим. Що ж, друзі, будемо прощатися. Всім гарного дня. До зустрічі. Чекайте від мене листи з усією інформацією. Гордона, ще раз, ще раз просто величезне дякую від усієї України. Дякую. Бай. Бай-бай.